Did you realize that Jesus was a small group leader? Think about his ministry. Yes, he spent time with crowds, and sometimes thousands and thousands of people came to hear him speak. He filled homes with people. He filled areas with a crowd. But most of his time was spent with 12 people, not any ordinary 12 people. These 12 men we call the 12 disciples, they came from various backgrounds, from various ages, from various regions. And he spent a lot of time with these 12, discipling them and preparing them for what would come ahead. He spent time as a small group leader. If you're watching this video, it's probably because you have been asked to be a small group leader, whatever that means. Whenever we gather a group of kids together from you know five to six kids to all the way up to 12, 15 kids, it creates a small group. It's where you can interact with those kids on, on a, a smaller basis, on a more one-to-one or you know one-to-two basis. That's a small group. Whether you call that a Sunday school or a discipleship or after you know school kids club, if you are leading kids as a small group leader, you are following in the footsteps of Jesus. And in the same way, let's look at some of the things that happened with the 12 and, and what are the benefits of being a small group leader? Well, I think there are two big benefits that we see both in the life of Jesus with the 12 and also what we see in those that lead kids in small groups. The first is small groups provide a space for connection. And the other great benefit for small groups is it creates a place for conversation. Let's look at this idea of connection first. When you're in a small group of kids, it begins with a place to help them connect specifically with God. As other videos are going to give you information about how kids learn in different ways. And so when kids are in larger groups, sometimes the ways that they best learn aren't met in those larger groups. But in our smaller groups, it gives us an opportunity to help kids connect to God in the ways that they best connect to Him. Maybe it is in separating themselves and being quiet with the Lord. Maybe it's through small group conversation that we'll cover in a minute. Maybe it's through different kinds of worship experiences and prayer and reading the Bible and memorizing scripture, but it helps connect them to God in different ways. Um, back in the Old Testament, there's the example of young Samuel. In uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3, Samuel describes his own meeting with the Lord. He had been raised in the temple um, with under the leadership of Eli. And one night as he laid asleep, he heard his name called and he thought it was Eli calling him. And after time and time again, he went into Eli and said, what do you want? And Eli said, no, it's not me. Go back to bed. Finally, Eli pointed out to Samuel, oh, that's, that's the Lord calling you. Hear the word of the Lord. And scripture says, for Samuel knew the Lord, but didn't yet really know his voice. Well, in small groups, it's an opportunity for you to help kids hear the voice of God, to connect with God um, in, in very specific ways. So it's a space for connection with God. It's also space for connection with you as the leaders. Here's what we know about children. If they have three adults in their life helping guide them towards Jesus, they are much more likely to follow Jesus for the rest of their life. That's what studies show. People who care about them and are pointing them towards God. And so being a small group leader is an opportunity to be part of a child's discipleship and helping guide them on the path. Whether you're their small group leader for a short period of time or for many, many years, you get to partner with them and you get to help guide them. They get to be connected to you. And those relationships are very important, especially because of this. Kids are hungry for an adult to listen to them. They're filled with um, conversation at school, but often it's one kid in a room of 20, 25 students. And sometimes they are competing for you know, attention at home with mom and dad, 
who live busy lives with other kids and, you know, and they really desire to be heard, to have someone listen to their thoughts, their questions, and their prayers. And so realize that that's an important connection, that they connect to you and through you to God because they get to see your life following Jesus. So don't discount the importance of that relationship. But also small groups provide an opportunity for kids to connect with other kids. Several years ago, I got to go to a wedding of one of my kids from children's ministry. She was now a young woman. And as I got there, I I knew what was going to happen. I saw two other young women walk down the aisle in front of her as her bridesmaids. And I was taken back to when these young women were in the third and fourth and fifth grade. These three young women did not grow up in the same neighborhood. They did not attend the same school. How did they know each other? Well, it was through the small groups at our church, through an after-school program for girls, for Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings. That's how they developed a relationship. And that relationship that began in childhood, it continued all the way through middle school and high school, through college, and they continue to support one another in their friendship as they are now having babies and and living life in, in different parts of the country. They are still connected because of those small group ministries. Giving space for kids to connect to other kids is going to be really important because they're going to need one another as they walk along this journey of discipleship through their middle school years and their high school years. So recognize that some of the activities that you're going to be doing in small groups where kids are connecting with one another, though it may not seem like they are the most spiritual activities, they are spiritual activities because they are connecting them to each other. Think about, again, the example of the 12 disciples. You know, the through their discipleship in that, that community, you know, they were connected to God, they were connected to their leader, Jesus, but they were also connected to each other because they were going to need each other in those relationships once Jesus departed. And so think about that. But also recognize that small groups are an opportunity for conversation. Now, some of those conversations are going to happen very organically. You know, as you gather kids uh, in the room, just talking about what's happening in the week or what's happening at school or what's happening at home, um, just things that they bring up. But one of the things I know that a lot of small group leaders kind of struggle with is the conversations that are a bit more structured, that um, after a Bible lesson, that they have some questions that they want to guide the kids through. And Sometimes that's a bit of a struggle. So I'd like to give you some pointers as to how to have those conversations that maybe aren't so organic, but rather a bit more structured. So let's look at, you know, how do you lead kids well in a conversation in those small group uh, meetings? And so we begin with this first. You need to have a plan. It doesn't have to be five or six or seven questions that you are going to be sure to ask them, but rather a general idea of the conversation that you would like to have with them, right? Some questions that get things started, some questions that might follow up, some questions that are connected to the Bible story as well as to their own life. And so have a general plan. Look at the materials that you've been provided. Maybe they've given you some questions to get you started Also recognize, though, you are the best leader of your kids. And so choose the questions that are going to best work for them. Change the questions as they're going to need and make a plan. And that plan should start with a great question that would launch you into a conversation. Notice I said conversation. I don't want it to be just you asking a question and then going around the table and having everyone answer. That's not a conversation. That's a question and answer time. Instead, how do you start a conversation? Some of the best ideas I know to help start a conversation is this. First of all, assume that a child knows nothing about the Bible. So don't start with a Bible question because that can put some of the kids on the outside of the conversation if they don't know the answer. The second thing is make sure that you ask what we call an open-ended question rather than a closed question. Here's an example. So a common story taught to kids is David and Goliath. And as David goes out to meet Goliath, 
Um, in the Old Testament story, he stops and he picks up stones. And you could ask the question, well, how many stones did he take? Well, that's a closed ended question because the answer is five. There's only one answer to that question. And so that doesn't start a conversation. That just checks to see if the kids were listening to the Bible story. But instead, what's a question about the same kind of topic that all of the kids could have a conversation about and actually could be a conversation that doesn't require them to even know the story of David and Goliath. So a question like, what do you do when you're afraid? Or what do you do when something is really big in front of you? And how do you, how do you tackle that problem? You know, And letting kids have a conversation that then leads into follow-up about the story specifically. You want to get everyone talking if possible. You could ask them to just give you one word that answers the question so that everyone can participate. Now recognize there's gonna be some that are gonna be hesitant, but if you ask a good open-ended question, that can get the conversation started. Once the conversation has gotten started, now your job is to guide the discussion. You get to play traffic cop. You get to help bring in different students at different times. You also need to put the brakes on certain students. There are some students in your classroom that will want to answer every question and always want to be the first one to answer that question. I was that student. So it's okay for you to tell kids like me, no, you know, hold on, let, let's let someone else answer. Or let's just have you say one sentence and then let's pass it off to someone else. One of the ways that I have, um, help students in kind of guiding the conversations is doing something I've learned from uh, some of my school teacher friends. And that is called the think, pair, share. And what we encourage at that point is you ask a question and you ask the students, why don't you think about it for 30 seconds? And you kind of track the time. And then you say, rather than shouting out the answer or telling you uh, the answer, pair up with someone or get into small groups of two or three. Share that question with someone else, the, what your response is to with someone else, and then bring everyone back together and you can share it with everyone. Now, one of the one of the fun little tricks I'll do sometimes with kids, especially to help them listen well to one another is, is say, when you share, I don't want you to share your answer, I want you to share the answer of your friend. And what that does is that helps get everyone to participate, it guides the conversation, and it helps to uh, mitigate those that maybe like to talk more than others. And so you wanna guide uh, the conversation. You also, though, want to create some time for quiet. Whether you use something like the think, pair, share idea, or just say, I want you to sit and think about this question. Maybe you would wanna write it on a board or give it to them on a piece of paper, have them write it down and reflect on it. We recognize that some students are always ready to respond to your question and some are more hesitant. And here's the thing about some of those hesitant learners. Sometimes they actually are coming up with a response that's fantastic or they're gonna say something that really helps you to understand kind of how they're processing the information maybe even give you insight that you didn't have yourself. But in, unless we kind of create that space for quiet, um, it, it sometimes won't happen. And so in directing the conversation and guiding that conversation, create some space where kids can be quiet and gives them permission to stop and to think. When you are guiding the conversation, when you're bringing them along, one of the things you wanna do is watch for what we call nonverbal cues. Kids will often show you with their bodies how they wanna respond or not respond. If kids are looking right at you, it might be that they wanna say something, but they're afraid to raise their hand. If they're not looking at you, it probably means, please do not call on me, and maybe don't call on them. Maybe they're embarrassed, or maybe they don't know the answer, maybe they are afraid to answer. If some are, you know, jumping at, you know, the opportunity, hey, let them, you know, respond appropriately. But Watch and see how are they using their bodies to signal to you how are they participating. 
Or if they are rolling their eyes or looking bored, know that maybe you're not connecting with them very well. Or if they have that confused look on their face, it's because maybe the question you asked doesn't quite make sense to them. And so you may need to restate it, but be watching for those nonverbal cues. And one of the ways that really is helpful to see the nonverbal cues is to think about the space in which you are putting your small group. One of the best ways is to make sure that everyone is sitting around like a table or in a circle and everyone is at the same level, including you. That helps to make sure that you can see all of their faces and see all of the signals that they are making as well as they can see you clearly. Um, we want to allow for a variety of participation in our small groups. And what I mean by that is, yeah, sometimes in a conversation you expect everybody to answer verbally, but maybe not everybody wants to. So think about, could they write down a response? Could they draw a response? Could they maybe create art as a response? Some of your students, they would prefer that kind of response. And then once they've had the opportunity to think about it in that way, then maybe they would articulate a response to you. So think about discussion. It doesn't always have to be verbal. It can also be visual or tactile. And so allow that opportunity for people to have a variety of responses. And finally, as as you're guiding them through a conversation, what you want to do is you want to conclude the conversation well. You want to make sure that they understand why you had the conversation at all. What did you learn? What did you hear them say? Affirm what you, um, the conversation that happened and say, here's, here's what we discussed and here's how it connects to um, our Bible lesson for today or here's what I learned from even listening to you. Summarize the conversation before you move on so that they know, okay, this part of our you know, this part of our time together has concluded and we're ready to move on to another activity or the conclusion of our lesson. Now, discussions in different small groups, some weeks they go great. You know, you've asked the right opening question, the right kind of students are there and they're all ready to jump in and the conversation just flows easily. And some weeks it doesn't go so well. And sometimes those weeks are one week after the other. Here's the thing about leading small groups is it's sometimes a complex thing. It doesn't always go easy. But what I wanna remind you is you're not alone in this process. The Holy Spirit is there with you, guiding you is the leader alongside of you going before you. And some of the conversations that you have, you may not think that anything comes of it, but the Holy Spirit has planted a seed, a conversation that then germinates over time. Maybe you've said something or they've heard something from someone else. And so uh, week after week after week, just continue to practice trying uh, different kinds of discussion with your students, recognizing that our small group discipleship is very important in the life of a child. It's gonna be one of the many times that they are with the people of God, helping to form them into the image of Christ.